Uh, good evening. Uh, I was just informed that the league always starts its events on time, so we're a little uh, four minutes late tonight. I want to welcome everyone to our panel on health care uh, tonight. I hope no one was offended by our referring to our program under the rubric of Obamacare, but we do know that the president adopted that as his own, given that I think he didn't have any choice. But uh, this is a uh, forum on the impact of the Patient Protection and uh, Affordable Care Act on California and particularly on those of us who live in Alameda, residents, businesses, and so on. So we have a wonderful panel tonight, but I would like to begin by introducing uh, Kate Quick, who is our league president, and I should have introduced myself. I'm Ruth Dixon, the program chair. So Kate. Thanks, Ruth. I'm about 15 feet smaller than she is, or <laughs> less tall. But um, welcome, everybody, and we're so glad that you're here. I think this is a, um, a topic that is not only very current with all of us, but one that, on which there is a lot of misinformation and disinformation. So this is an opportunity for us to ask questions, to hear experts tell us what's up and uh, hopefully go away just a little bit uh, more knowledgeable about what the impacts of the Affordable Health Care Act will be on us right here at home in Alameda. I'd like to point out just a few things to you that are back on the table, which you're welcome to take. Um, one of them is the League's history and position with respect to health care. We never take positions or talk about anything that we have not studied. And we have studied health care more than once over the many 30-something years that I've been in league. So um, we'd like you to know what our position is. And that's the result of several national studies and a state study that I know about. Um, there's also uh, the flyer for tonight's meeting, if you want to be reminded of who our panelists are um, later, just for your reference. A couple of league um, pamphlets. One is our membership pamphlet, and of course we like everybody, men and, men and women, to join the league and join us in doing this kind of work, uh, informing the electorate about uh, matters of public policy that might be of interest and use to them. Um, so please pick one of these membership brochures up. That's the one that's in red, white, and blue. The yellow one says, know your representatives, and it has the names, addresses, emails, and phone numbers of all the people that represent us from our Alameda City officials all the way uh, through the president. It doesn't have his phone number, but it does have his email. Uh, and I noticed that we haven't updated this for, uh, it still has Pete Stark on here, and uh, we know Barbara Lee is now our representative, so we'll be running off some with Barbara Lee. Uh, another thing I always like to point out to people, and, and you guys can pick one of these up back there too, a smart voter. Bookmark, League has a website called smartvoter.org, and it has election information on it. So during times like our last election in November, uh, people could go there and look at in-depth information about all of the propositions and the candidates who chose to uh, post. Uh, they post bios, sometimes they post little videos, they post all kinds of stuff. So um, it's a place where voters can become educated at their own pace. But we encourage people to use smartvoter.org. It's all neutral information. League is a nonpartisan organization. We never support or oppose a candidate for office. We do, as I said, support certain issues or oppose certain issues that come up if we have studied them and have an existing position from which we can speak. So I thank Tracy and I thank Ruth um, for putting together this program. Um, Shuba, 
oh, there you are, Shiva Fancy is our health care committee um, chair, and she's going to be um, having a meeting of the health care committee before too long, and they're the kind of people that talk about these issues in depth as well. So um, I think the league is present to the whole health care issue, and we hope that you'll um, enjoy the meeting tonight. Thank you. Now, on uh, Thursday, January 24th, Governor Brown called an extraordinary session of the California State Legislature to implement the federal uh, guidelines on health care reform. He um, proclaimed that there would be an extraordinary session to consider and act upon legislation necessary to implement the Federal Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act as amended by another act. And um, the legislature was going to address the following areas, California's private health coverage market, rules and regulations governing individual and small group markets, uh, and so on, um, California's Medi-Cal program and changes that are necessary, uh, and options that allow low-cost health coverage to be provided to individuals who uh, with incomes up to 200% of the federal poverty level within the California Health Benefit Exchange. Now, tonight we're going to deal with just uh, not all of these issues, and we're going to deal with some additional issues because we have a uh, panel here that, with, uh, that represents the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services with David Sand talking about Medicare and Medi-Cal. We have a uh, representative of Gallagher Benefit Services, which deals with employer um, plans uh, aimed at uh, obtaining the best coverage for their employees and uh, the choices that they offer. And we have Debbie Sands, uh, Debbie Stebbin, excuse me, whom you know from the, um, Alam who's chief executive officer of the Alameda Hospital. So um, uh, Tracy Jensen is going to be introducing our panelists and she's going to be moderating. Uh, she's organized the panel, and uh, for this we appreciate it enormously. And just last week, she, uh, Tracy was appointed to the vacant position on the board of directors of the Alameda Healthcare District. So, congratulations to Tracy. <laughs> Tracy uh, was last year's chair of the program committee at uh, League of Women Voters. And she's been on the boards of the Alameda Soccer Club, the Alameda County Community Food Bank, the Alameda School Board, on which she served from 2002 through 2010. And she was also co-chair of the Alameda Collaborative for Children, Youth, and Their Families in 2010, 2010, when Alameda was first recognized as one of the 100 best cities for youth. So just a note on procedure, we um, are going to have Dave Sands, Dave Brown, and Debbie speak in that sequence. Each of them will speak about 15, 20 minutes, and following each speaker will have questions addressed to that speaker. And um, uh, we're going to try to keep that to 10 minutes or so, and I hope you'll keep your questions general, you know, of interest to all of us and not bring up your sort of personal dilemmas and decisions at this point because that will be very, very complicated for anyone to deal with. Um, and then if we have time at the end, we'll ha we will have a little bit more general discussion. So with that, um, Tracy, would you like to introduce our speaker? Thanks, Ruth, and thanks for um, taking on the program committee. You're doing a great job. I want to start with um, with just a little bit of information for you all. Tomorrow, there's kind of a big event in Alameda Hospital. If you have some time tomorrow and you want to know what your possible stroke risk is, go, well, first you should call 814-4362, 814-4362, or go online to alamedahospital.org, and um, you can get an appointment, hopefully, hopefully if there's some space left to um, get your community stroke assessment, your stroke assessment for your risk of stroke. And that's one of the great things, as um, Ruth mentioned, I'm now on the board, recently appointed to the board of the Alameda Healthcare District, and we have a tremendous resource in Alameda, a tremendous resource that I'm learning more and more about, even though I've been treated there more than once, and um, I've been aware of the hospital for many, many years. We're, we're fortunate to have Debbie Stebbins here, who's been CEO of the hospital 
since late 2007, and she's really been moving the hospital and the healthcare district into a, um, a, a new direction to really keep it in as an effective provider of community and healthcare services in Alameda. The hospital has 100 acute, 35 subacute, and 26 skilled nursing beds, and it was it offers diagnostic and treatment services, cardiac rehabilitation, clinical laboratory diagnostic imaging, and um, a variety of services for Alamedans as well as for the surrounding community. So we're tremendously excited to have Debbie here. And as I introduce her, I'm going to um, point out that she'll be wrapping everything up to to, to tell us how the uh, for the Affordable Care Act is impacting us here in Alameda and the Alameda Healthcare District. I'm going to um, introduce everyone and then sit down because I've asked um, one of the panelists to to assist me in moderating. So um, I'm going to introduce Debbie Stebbins, Deborah Stebbins first, and then um, Dave, David Dave Brown, who's the area president. We're very fortunate to have Dave joining us here, another Alameda resident. Thanks, Dave, who um, is also a president of the San Francisco branch of Gallagher Benefit Services, which is a, a leading global risk and insurance broker. And Dave is really going to share information about what the um, Obamacare, how, how this affects the Affordable Care Act is going to affect businesses, local small businesses in particular, but how, how it affects the business community. And um, Dave has spent his entire career helping employers create and manage group benefit plans. And he and his executive colleagues are the second largest employee benefit consulting organization in the middle market here in, in um, nationally, I believe, right? Yeah, so they're, it's, it's a big organization, but it's also local. It's found every in, in all small um, cities like Alameda and elsewhere. And it, it supports in, um, large organizations as well as small businesses. And um, thanks for coming here and joining us, David. And then finally, I'll introduce someone who I know quite well because he is my partner and co-parent to a 12-year-old son that we have. And this is um, Dave Sign, who I... Um, invited here because he is really, really the local expert on the Affordable Care Act. Dave is the regional administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. He is leading the implementation of the Affordable Care Act in his region, which includes California, California, Arizona, Hawaii, Nevada, and those places in the Pacific. And that's oh, and some places in the in the um, Pacific that aren't states in which he hasn't taken me to yet, like Samoa, but I think someday we'll get together, <laughs> hopefully. So um, so Dave, Dave's an expert on the federal aspects and, and really on the Affordable Care Act from um, implementation by the White House. And he's working with the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services to get it implemented. And also working with people such as um, both Debbie and David Brown, who they all work together and they are colleagues to um, make sure that this is meeting the needs of communities, including Alameda. So, I'm going to sit down now and thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm really thrilled about the number, about all of you coming, about how many people have come tonight. And I'm, I'm going to give it to Dave Sign to, to moderate, to begin, and to um, start telling you the framework under which we're operating in the Affordable Care Act. Thank you all. Okay, thanks. Thanks, honey. Whoa. I'm not going to touch that. You all can hear me. I'm pretty loud. Um, pleasure to be here. and. I often think that with all the stuff you hear on the radio and the news about all this, if we picked people off the street and gave them just 10 sort of simple questions about what does this health care law mean, most of them probably wouldn't really know because it's not what you do every day for a living. We do it for a living and so we pay attention to it and it's great to be able to kind of share what little we do know with our neighbors about this. Well, why did this all happen? Well, because these big old expensive hospital bills were getting to be a real problem for folks. And there's something called uh, pre-existing condition, which is a situation where people were not able to get insurance because either they had an illness, they had had an illness in the past, or maybe they just have a genetic predisposition for an illness. And that's really, in my view, a form of discrimination. Uh, and so right now we've got about 50 million people in the country who don't have health insurance, many of them because they were not able to buy it uh, for this reason or others. And, and to me, um, you know, when I was a kid, you didn't see people on the street with wheelchairs. Uh, my grandfather was blind and they taught him how to make placemats and brooms. 
Um, and then we had the Americans with Disabilities Act, and now we see people who have, you know, certain conditions, maybe with mobility or everything, they, they get to have a, a full life and work and do things like everybody else. And I think this law is a lot like that in terms of making the world a little bit more fair for people that just happen to have had an illness. So if we think back to the 60s when the Medicare program came along, we had people like Bob Dylan telling us that the times were changing, and we had people like our former governor, President Reagan, producing films about how Medicare was a bad idea because it was socialized medicine and it would be a terrible thing. Well, it turns out not to have been too terrible of a thing because there's a lot of older folks now who benefited from that. So then we had our friends, the Clintons, and they took a shot in the 90s at helping us with health care. And they were kind of bumped off by those Harry and Louise commercials, where Harry and Louise said they didn't want the government in their medicine chest. But in this cartoon, we see that Harry lost his health insurance to a pre-existing condition, and Louise went bankrupt trying to pay for Harry's medical care. And so they're all gone, because now we have the Affordable Care Act. And one of the, there's a couple interesting things about this photo. First, we notice the prominence of the Californians, George Miller, uh, the representative from Contra Costa County is actually the author, author of the bill uh, that reconciled the health care law. He, that was passed like two days later uh, to make it conform with things in the Senate. He's a great uh, proponent. And then, of course, we have Nancy Pelosi, uh, who was the Speaker of the House at the time. And then, of course, also from my region, Harry uh, Reid from Nevada, who is still uh, the Senate Majority Leader. So quite a historic event. Some of you who follow the news may recall Mr. Biden had a little comment to the President as he was signing it about it being a big deal. And indeed, it was a big deal. We don't know what he's saying to that little boy there, but it's probably something clever. So. Those of you that are old enough to be on Medicare, I don't see anybody that looks old enough for Medicare, but maybe some of your parents uh, may recall the dreaded donut hole, which was the benefit design of Part D, where you join the program, there's a deductible, you have a benefit, and then when you exhaust that benefit, you're out. But if you have an extreme expense, there's a catastrophic benefit in the end. We were not allowed to call that uh, a donut hole when we were working for President Bush. We referred to it as the coverage gap. Now that we're working for President Obama, he doesn't like it, it's back to being a donut hole and it's going away as one of the features of the law uh, that affects people with Medicare. Over time, we're phasing that out. Uh, and right now, there's a discount on brand name drugs. We've introduced free preventive services such as mammography, flu shots, and so forth for people in Medicare, which is a great thing. Although the free annual wellness visit doesn't have a lot of uptake. Only about 5% of our seniors actually do that. And so it's something you can avail yourself of if you would like to, if you know folks in Medicare. And then finally, we have some new anti-fraud measures. We've actually had more recoveries last year than we've ever had before because of changes in the law. But what is really Obamacare? What's the thing people hate? What do the Republicans hate? What do the freedom people hate? They hate this mandate idea because they think they're taking away your freedom to not have insurance. It's sort of like the freedom to drive a motorcycle without a helmet. Why, if I want to die on that motorcycle, I should be allowed to. The problem is, when you die on the motorcycle, you might also take out a few people who weren't being uh, foolish and riding a motorcycle without a helmet and who had insurance and so forth. So the law is based on this idea that if everyone presents with insurance, uh, then the folks over at Alameda Hospital will be able to collect payment for the people they care for uh, and not have a lot of folks that can't pay because they don't have insurance. Because in case you haven't noticed, the cost of things in healthcare has gotten so expensive that the average household can't afford them. I'm going to have a little procedure done tomorrow, and I learned yesterday that the copay is $400. Sounds like a lot of money, but the actual procedure is probably a ten dollars or $20,000 job. People could never afford to pay uh, for the things that we're having done these days. It's much more sophisticated. So the law requires folks that, to have insurance either from their employer or purchased on their own. There are some exceptions, so people that can't afford it, people that have a religious objection, Native Americans and so forth, and people in jail, because people in jail get coverage from the state. Uh, so the law hopes to create coverage now for about 30 million of the 50 million people I referred to, uh, because the law does not provide benefits for people that are not either uh, legal residents or citizens. And there's quite a few folks, particularly here in California, who fall into that category. Uh, and there are some things in the law to help those, but that's not our topic tonight. Some of you might have noticed in this past week there was an article in Time Magazine, longest article by a single author that has ever been published in Time Magazine. It's 36 pages long, and it's a discussion of about why 
medical costs are so high, and it's, it's quite interesting, so I threw that on there to kind of bring that to your attention. And so in addition to creating this individual coverage requirement, the law creates these marketplaces uh, with the intent that the state would run them that will make coverage available to people in an understandable way. And what I mean is this, right now, if I want to buy insurance coverage and I call up Anthem Blue Cross and I call up HealthNet and I call up Kaiser, I don't know how to compare what they're offering. It's not like they're all cars and they all have four wheels and a steering wheel and air conditioning. They could be offering me entirely different things. One policy might pay me you know, $2,000 for every day I'm in the hospital. One policy might say, well, you can only go to our hospital. They're different. Under this uh, marketplace scheme, there's going to be four standard benefit packages, bronze, gold, silver, platinum, and they actually all have the same required benefits, it's just that the costs are a little bit different. So some of them, you could pay a higher premium up front and not worry about the co-pays, or if you're a gambler, you could choose the cheaper package, pay a smaller premium, but then if you have a problem like me, you're going to face the $400 copay. So in California, the state has created an organization called Covered California, which is headed up by my friend Peter Lee, and they are going to set up these marketplaces for individuals and small employers to be able to find insurance plans, apples to apples, that are affordable. But the really important thing about the marketplace is that they will certify that these health plans are solvent, they're good, they know what they're doing, and the most important thing is they will administer this subsidy. And so that's what's really important, is that in the law, there's money to help people afford insurance based upon your income, much like the way if you apply for financial aid for a, a child, let's say, they're going to look at what you're able to pay. And basically, uh, the law provides a tax credit in the form of paying some of your premium for you, and this goes all the way up to people that make four times the federal poverty level, which for a family of four is $92,000. I mean, there's parts of the country where if you're making $92,000 as a family, you're doing pretty good. Unfortunately, Alameda and San Francisco are not one of those places. We know it's very expensive to live here. But nonetheless, that's a lot of people. We think it's about 80% of the people that are going to come looking for insurance. And so the way that's going to work is those folks um, Will, can go online or they can go with one of the people that will have to help them and the premium for them will be discounted uh, based upon their income. Now the insurance that these going to be available is not just some cheapo, you know, give you a cash settlement if you're sick. There have to be 10 required benefit categories and we actually just published the final regulation on this. So things like um, Dental care for, for mi minors is required, unfortunately not for adults. Uh, maternity has to be required. You know, right now in California, a woman of the same age would pay more for insurance than a man because to the insurance business, sorry Dave, being female is kind of a pre-existing condition because there's this risk that you might get pregnant. And they also sell policies that don't have maternity. So that's really useful. You're like a 24-year-old woman, but you're not covered if you get pregnant, which is something that women often do. So this is going to be real insurance, and it's going to create a level playing field so that it's kind of work having. Uh, so I was going to just throw a couple of numbers at you, and then I'm going to get out of here. Who are these people that aren't uninsured in our state? Well, the, the, the uh, people who have covered California have looked at this, and the biggest category is actually adult students. So there's a lot of people in their 20s who are still in college, or they're in graduate school, or maybe they're learning how to be you know, carpenters or whatever, there's a lot of folks in that category that are uninsured, almost a million people. A lot of people who work in construction, because we know there's union construction jobs where you have good coverage, but then there's a lot of people that work for small firms that can't afford to provide the coverage. Uh, a lot of people in the restaurant industry, food service, uh, <coughs> agriculture, landscaping, and finally, you know, private households, people that work as domestics or work for people. And Covered California is going to do a lot of things to help these people enroll. So they figure a little less than half the people, you know, will do this on the computer either by themselves or maybe uh, with some help. Uh, and then the state will fund some service centers to help people who want to walk in. They'll have people doing it over on the phone. They'll have a variety of ways for people to look at uh, the coverage that's available and take advantage of it. So about two-thirds of the people who will become covered next year will do so through this exchange and subsidy methodology. 
Another third, however, will get coverage because what we know is Medi-Cal in California and all the Medicaid programs is going to fundamentally change as a result of the law. So today, Medi-Cal is only available to pregnant women, kids, and adults with a disability who meet an income test. So it's a, a category of people. Uh, but the law changes that and makes it simply a matter of a financial requirement. So for people that make less than uh, it's about 133% of the poverty level, uh, they'll all qualify for Medi-Cal. So otherwise healthy adults who just don't make that much money, like people that work at Walmart, for example, uh, may qualify for Medicaid under this law, and that's a big expansion. And that actually has a lot to do with why the governor had to call the special session uh, to make some changes in uh, state law to make Medicaid conform with the new federal rules. And one of the important changes in Medicare is that or Medicaid is first that we're going to increase what the states pay for primary care, like your internists, your family physicians, so that there'll be more of them available, and also that this additional coverage under Medi-Cal for the first three years of this program is 100% federal money. So that's where we are at uh, HHS. We want to see a lot more people have insurance coverage. We think that we may not have a plan that's perfect, but we've got a pretty darn good one, and the challenge for us is to have these exchanges up and running and enrolling people in October for an open season that will bring people into coverage in January. So that's a, a quick uh, summary of the federal perspective on the law, and I could just take one or two questions and then we'll go to our next panelist. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm wondering about Medicare. Um, so if, you're, if you presently have Medicare and you have... All right, so there's a lot of stuff in this law that has nothing to do with these private insurance exchanges and so forth. There's a lot of Medicare changes in the law. The Medicare changes in the law are the free preventive services, so there's no copay for mammography, colonoscopy, and so forth, and the reduction of prices for prescription drugs in the donut hole. But the most important change is there's some structural changes in the program that extend the financial solvency of the Medicare trust fund for another 12 years until like 2024. But other than that, if you're an individual and you've got Medicare and a supplement or you're in Kaiser or one of the other Medicare plans, this doesn't really change your world. It just gives you a few more benefits. Simple as that. You don't have to do anything. Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. The question is, for the ships at sea, what's this going to cost? How does this work out financially? Well, the Congressional Budget Office, which is the nonpartisan organization that advises the Congress, scored the bill. They calculate what's going to happen over 20 years of this bill and determine that it would actually reduce the federal deficit. It's a saver uh, to the government because right now, we provide funds to Alameda Hospital and other hospitals to cover the cost of care for people that can't pay. Interestingly, hospitals are the only business that are required by law to give their service away. If you present over there and you're active labor or you're deathly ill, they have to care for you until you're stable, which can be quite a while. And so a better plan to deal with that under the concept of the law is if everyone has insurance, then Overall, things will be uh, more efficient and cheaper. So that's uh, kind of the core strategy uh, behind this. Now, whether those projections hold true, as exactly planned, you know, anybody knows. But we do know from uh, the other developed countries that have universal coverage, their costs tend to be lower and they have a more orderly system. So we're hoping that that'll uh, bear fruit. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as to cost for 
Okay. First question with respect to primary care and family doctors, we have a problem that physicians aren't choosing to go into those fields because they're not as lucrative. It's not that they're less lucrative because of the, the pay, so to speak. The issue is the procedure-based uh, specialties like eye surgery, orthopedics, they can churn a lot of procedures and it's more profitable. Um, so one of the things the statute did is required Medicaid programs to increase what they pay for primary care. That's a good thing, but that won't necessarily produce a lot more primary care docs. Another thing we've done is moved our residencies you all might not know that the, great, the, the majority of the cost of medical education is not paid by the medical students, it's paid by the government who pays for the residency programs where they train after they finish medical school. So we're moving those into community settings. There's a new medical school at the University of California down in, uh, in Riverside that has no hospital uh, residencies at all. They're all in community practice. So there's some things and there's loans and things to improve and make it more desirable for docs to go into those fields. There's also incentives for care models that use more of a care team approach to extend uh, the use of the physicians and have other power professionals uh, helping people. So there, is, there are some things to deal with that primary care problem. It's not a 100% fix. With respect to prescription drugs and Medicare, uh, there's nothing of significance in this law that changes Medicare Part D. What we saw this year is the premiums stayed pretty much the same, uh, two or three dollars uh, larger overall. But the issue of the government negotiating directly with uh, manufacturers of drugs, which has been uh, on the president's agenda they would like to do, that's not in this statute. Um, the president is still talking about that. Um, and the thing that I like to think about is there's no perfect arrangement in the world, but when we think about a situation where the government now is the largest purchaser of a thing and we're negotiating for it, you're getting into the world of the Defense Department and the, the problems that they've had with Westinghouse and Martin Marietta, because then the negotiation becomes a political act and it has its own complexity to it, and it's not, there's no panacea, um, but some people still believe that's a good idea and they're arguing for that. The way Part D works, doesn't really allow for that because the individual plans negotiate, so you would have to restructure Part D uh, to make it look like Medi-Cal, which is where they do it that way. So I'm getting the hook, so I'll take one more question, and I'll be here at the end. So, Quick question. Yeah. Will it have any effect on the cost of private insurance? Ah, there's the million dollar question. I'm going to leave that one for Mr. Brown. The question is, how, will this, how might this affect the cost of private insurance, which is a, a million-dollar question. And with that, I'll introduce Dave Brown from Gallagher Benefit Services. And I have to tell you that we're all friends because we all belong to a business roundtable together. and We've known each other really now for several years. I think I've known Debbie in a couple of her uh, careers. And it's a real pleasure to work with these folks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thanks for coming out. Um, just a, a couple of framing comments. Um, Dave was uh, apologizing, if you would, for the, for the jab at the insurance companies. And just in the interest of clarity, I want to make sure you understand the distinction. I do not work for an insurance company. We advise employers on how to design and manage their plans. And when their employees or uh, other dependents get into a jam with the insurance companies, we're the ones who work through the red tape to get the problems solved and, and things back on their way. So we are not the risk takers, we're not the ones denying coverage, et cetera. So we, re we retain an objective view of the marketplace, which we think is really important and valuable. Um, so just a, one quick comment about the, the cost of, of care as, as we see it going forward. Um, there's a couple of dynamics to consider here. Uh, first of which is a famous law of economics called supply and demand. And it's not a theory, it's a law, like gravity. And um, one of the things that I, I fear for with, with this law is it won't be able to overcome the shortage of primary care practitioners as, uh, as you questioned earlier. Um, as it relates real quickly to the, to the cost of premiums, the American Academy of Actuaries about two weeks ago 
uh, released their projection, the impact of the plan, or the, of the, uh, the law on, on individual health plans. And in California, starting next year, all individual health policies will be uh, managed and, um, and obtained through Covered California, the public exchange. Uh, the American Academy of Actuaries is estimating that the going in premium increase for 2014 for individual plans, this is a national average, but it's still going to shake your boots, 40% increase. 40. So um, this is due to um, a lot of uncertainty about the, the risk pool of people coming in. Um, there, one of the things that makes group insurance work, for example, is the idea that you sign up when you're first eligible. And so the coverage is there in, when, during times when you need, need it for claims, and it's also there when you're, done, when you're not. And so you're spreading the risk over time. The concern with the population coming into the exchanges, particularly those who haven't been insured before, is no one knows what their health status is. We don't know what pent-up demand is there. We don't know what kind of intensity of services they're going to need. So the Academy of Actuaries is an independent um, advisory body. Uh, there's probably a few insurance company actuaries in there, but most of them are consulting actuaries, and they don't have any dog in this fight either. So um, that's an objective guess uh, as to where the premiums are going to start out um, in the exchange uh, January next year. So. For 36 years, I've been delivering bad news. So, you know, <laughs> just one more evening of it tonight. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to talk mostly about the employer perspective here. Um, how many folks here are employers with employees? OK. Um, any of you have, say, more than 25 employees? More than 50? All right, so we'll address mostly uh, the larger employer marketplace. The good news is, and we'll touch on this in a little more detail, that most small employers are not affected directly by the law. So if you've got a, a business with eight or ten employees, uh, there's very little impact of the law on you as a business owner, uh, but your employees are still subject to that individual mandate that, that Dave referred to earlier. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just jump right in. Um, the, the law was passed a couple of years ago, and ever since then we've had um, a torrent of uh, new, new provisions, new effective dates, and a lot of regulation. Um, there was a, a health plan executive recently compared the Affordable Care Act and the regulations that will accompany it to like this, documents the same size as the Internal Revenue Code. Um, so in addition to the threatening our trees, um, this is very, very complicated. And so um, those, and it, and it touches all facets of the medical, medical world. So we're just going to focus on just the insurance part of it today. But some of the things that, have, that are coming to bear in 2013, we start with W-2 reporting, where you'll notice on your uh, W-2s for information only that the cost of the employer contribution for your health care is now on your W-2. Um, earlier, Dave was talking about the ability to compare policies. The summary of benefits and coverage will be a standardized form um, that at least attempts to compare different kinds of plans for you in a standard format to make those more understandable. Uh, women's preventive services is a pretty controversial topic, um, depending largely on your religious beliefs, but um, the intent is to provide um, pr pregnancy preventive services um, free of charge to women throughout the country. Um, the reference to non-grandfather plans is a technical one we'll skip for the time being. Um, for those of you who have employer-sponsored plans and uh, use flexible spending accounts to help offset some of your out-of-pocket expenses, works on a pre-tax basis like a 401k and you reimburse yourself, uh, for the first time this year, the, the uh, contributions that you can make to that kind of plan are capped at $2,500 a year, typically before the maximum uh, wasn't statutorily limited, but a lot of employers have plans at four and five thousand dollar limits. Um, there are some new taxes in the law. Um, a colleague of mine refers to this as the largest tax increase in U.S. history, and a couple of those are the uh, clinical effectiveness research fee that employers are going to have to pay 
um, on behalf of the, the plans and then uh, additional payroll taxes. And then the last item here real quick is a new exchange notice, which is a notice that employers are required to give to their employees telling them that the exchange exists. Now, a lot more is going to be happening next year. Dave touched on the um, open season starting in October of this year for plans or for, for coverage effective January 1 next year. Um, other things that are coming online next year, uh, supposedly there was going to be um, uh, automatic enrollment where employers with over 200 employees had to um, automatically enroll their employees electronically. Um, the requirement in the law is still there, but um, there's a lot of details that we still have to wait on. There are new non-discrimination rules in the law um, that we haven't seen any guidance on yet um, that are, are promising or, or uh, predicted to be very complicated. Um, incentives for, for wellness and employer plans uh, has been increased so that uh, employers can offer their employees higher monetary incentives for good behavior. And then there are some important patient protections in the law that start next year. Um, first of which, if you're an, a new employee at an employer, um, you, can't be, you can't wait any more than 90 days before starting your coverage unless you're a variable employee. Um, elimination of the pre-existing conditions like Dave mentioned. Um, the essential benefits, the 10 categories of benefits that Dave referenced earlier has no annual limits starting next year. And um, then I want to also touch on two important taxes. Um, that are going to really have an impact on the pricing of any benefit plan or any individual coverage. Um, the first is a, a three-year transitional reinsurance fee of $63 per person per year. You multiply that out and it gets into big numbers very, very quickly. And then insured plans uh, such as the Kaiser and Health Nets and Anthems of the world are also going to have an additional uh, tax on them um, that will get passed through in the premiums. And so we're projecting that the impact of these two taxes alone will add about 4 to 5% to the cost of, of the average premium. 4 to 5, not 45. But <laughs> 4 O R 5. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're going to touch a little bit more now on the individual mandate, and I'm going to show you a couple of flow charts here that might help you understand it. So uh, the employee up here that we're, that we're showing um, is not under an employer-sponsored plan at this point, or if he is, he's, he's working for an employer with less than 50 employees, uh, but he's subject to the individual mandate. And what that means is that he, that person has to go to the exchange and buy a, one of the, the metal coverages that Dave referenced, and I'll show you those in a second, um, or you pay a, a penalty, um, and we'll touch on the penalties in a second. So that penalty be, will, will be assessed on your tax return, uh, like some of the other things that, where the government collects their money today. Now, uh, subject to certain qualifications, the individuals can get premium assistance, and Dave referenced that as well. And that's based on, um, on your earnings for the family, the family income. Now, for, here's how the, how the exchanges are going to work. Uh, starting in 2014, the exchanges will be available for individuals, such as the ones I just described, and also for small groups for um, employers of under 100 employees. Covered California has come out and said that their primary focus, though, is individuals. If they get some smaller, uh, smaller group clients in there, they'll be happy, but they're really focused on, on the not covered individuals today. Large groups are expected to be eligible for the public exchanges starting in 2016. Just don't want to complicate it too much, but you may hear about private exchanges. And private exchanges um, are coming onto the market now, uh, some of them are being sponsored by competitor, competitors of ours. Um, we're actually leasing a private exchange from another entity uh, and bringing it to the market as well. And they're going to be competing with the public exchanges and also represent another way for employers to provide benefits. All of this is going to get all that much more complicated. 
But going back to our individual here who's looking to go into the exchange, um, he's going to have a choice of uh, four basic plans, um, ranging the least rich would be the bronze plan. That will have the lowest premium and the highest um, out-of-pocket exposure, uh, all the way up to the platinum plan. So that's the, the richest of the plans. There's also going to be a catastrophic plan, which is a high deductible, low premium plan. It'll be available only to folks under age 30 or those who are in transition between jobs for a short period of time. So that's the marketplace here in this, in this middle column. And then uh, the providers on the right side, we don't, don't think of those as medical providers. Those are symbols representing the health plans. And so there are all the usual suspects who uh, may be participating in the public exchange. They'll, we'll be finding that out over the next 60 to 90 days. And the usual suspects are referred to are Kaiser, Anthem, Blue Shield, HealthNet, Aetna, Cigna, United, et cetera. Um, but there are also likely to be um, other public health plans. Uh, some of the county plans may be um, participating as well. It's just, we just don't know yet. Uh, and the state's working through that process, the carrier selection process right now. And so the premium assistance credit, or the subsidy that we, we were referring to earlier, um, for folks who have employer-sponsored coverage, for the most part, these subsidies are not going to be applicable. The subsidies are available for individuals who don't have access to employer-sponsored plans unless the employer plan has a very low actuarial value and that the cost sharing for payroll deduction to get access to the coverage is deemed unaffordable or greater than 9.5% of the individual's W-2 wages and that the employee's income is between um, 100 and 400% of the federal poverty level. So long story short, what I'd like you to remember here is that for the most part, um, employer, people who are covered under employer-sponsored plans will not be eligible for the subsidy. Um, it's primarily for the individuals who don't have access to that employer-sponsored plan. Now here's a flow chart of what the, the, flow char the flow chart that describes the employer decisions or the employer responsibility. We're going to start with the uh, question I raised earlier about do you have at least 50 employees? If the answer is no, then the employer has no responsibility under the law, no mandate to provide coverage. If the employer has more than 50 employees, um, then they are required to provide coverage and there's a penalty of $2,000 per full-time equivalent employee per year um, after the first 30. So if you have 100 employees, you pay the penalty on 70. Um, and uh, that is a non-deductible penalty to the employer. If the employer is providing coverage to his, his full-time equivalents, um, that's 30 hours a week or more, and the plan provides the minimum value, then the, again, the employer passes that test. If the plan does not have the minimum value, there's another set of penalties um, of $3,000 per employee who falls out and is receiving um, a tax credit by, because it's unaffordable and the coverage was not at the, min the minimum level. And then the, the next test is the coverage affordable. Again, if the answer is yes, the employer is off the hook, there's no penalty. Clear as mud, right? Okay, so the, the part, of the, um, part of the angst in the business community out there revolves around employers who are roughly around 50 employees, say 45. Do they hire and go past 50? Do they make new hires and put them on part-time hours only? There's a, there are a lot of technical rules around here to define whether or not a company has 50 full-time equivalent employees. That's a really critical threshold. Again, if it's over 50, then there's a requirement to provide coverage. If it's under 50, the employer's off the hook. And then there are arcane rules around part-time and seasonal employees, which I'll touch on again in just a second. But basically, there are five categories of em employees defined in the law. The top two are the ones we're most typically familiar with, full-time permanent employees and part-time permanent employees. 
Um, basically, at 30 hours or more, you're, you're full time and you, you do need to be offered coverage. Um, part times under 30, no, you don't. So you can imagine there'll be a lot of situations where, well, we think there'll be a lot of situations where employers might have someone working 32, 33 hours. People might have the expectation they're gonna get coverage, but the employer could be cutting them back to 25, 26, 28 hours and not providing coverage at all. Uh, for seasonal variable and variable employees, um, there are the, those rules that I referred to. Basically, think of it as not unlike um, the hour banks that you see in union plans, where folks like in the construction trades work hours in a given period of time to qualify for coverage in a later period. And that's what these rules are about for temporary and, and, and seasonal and variable employees. Real simple, huh? So we're gonna show you a couple of quick examples of impacts on potential participants. First one here is an engineer who makes $95,000 a year. He's above 400% of the federal poverty line. Uh, because he's over 400%, um, he, doesn't, he doesn't qualify for any subsidy, and um, he's, got, he's got coverage from his employer. There's no penalty. In the next example, this is one that gets a little more controversial and, and more to the meat of the situation. Uh, Billy Bellhop here uh, makes only $16,000 a year, so he clearly falls within the federal poverty guidelines. Um, and he's, attributing, he's contributing $150 to payroll deduction per month for the coverage that he has. And because that exceeds 9.5% of his income, um, that coverage is deemed not affordable. And so that employer now gets subject to the, one of the penalties we talked about, in this case, the $3,000 penalty for not having provided rich enough benefits. The third example um, is, um, in this case, a, a hotel manager. Um, she has family coverage. Uh, she makes about 250% of the federal poverty line. Um, now, she contributes a lot for her coverage, $900 a month but the 9.5% rule applies only to the employee-only portion of it, and her employee-only portion is $100 a month. It's less than 9.5%, so there's no penalty to the employer. Now, one of the things that we're gonna see over the next several years um, are employers reacting to the so-called Cadillac tax, which comes in in 2018. I can tell you that for a lot of organizations who are providing coverage today, they're not as worried about all these other rules that I just covered because they really don't affect them. But the Cadillac tax is something that they've got their sights on. Um, we see a lot of employers today whose premiums are already edging up to the Cadillac tax limits of almost $10,000 for an individual or $27,500 for a family. And so you, if you, um, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but. But the, what the tax says is that if your plan cost exceeds those thresholds, that the employer is going to be responsible for paying 40 cents on the dollar for every dollar that exceeds the threshold, 40% excise tax. I guarantee you employers are not interested in paying that excise tax. So over the next several years, employers, especially the savvy ones, are going to be staging changes in their plans so that they don't collide with this tax in 2018. And so what that generally is going to mean is that you're gonna see cost shifting in employer plan designs, deductibles and the like are gonna be rising um, in, in relation to this. Um, you're gonna see increased adoption of, of health savings accounts um, for, for employees to save and, and accept employer contributions to offset these deductibles. Um, it's gonna be very complicated design scenarios. Okay, what, it, what the Cadillac tax is, it's basically a cap on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the employer contribution for coverage. So that $10,500 number rough, is roughly about $850 a month. So if an employer in 2018 is paying more than $850 a month for a single employee's coverage, for every dollar over that, they're gonna pay a tax of of 40%. So if it's $950, they're going to pay $40 a month in additional taxes. Well, is that because the health plan is 
charging them that much? Because the cost of health plan they are charging them? It, it could be because the health plan is charging that much. Keep in mind that a lot of larger employers self-insure, where they are, are not buying full coverage from the insurance companies. The larger employers will uh, fund the claims that, that we all have. I belong to a self-funded plan. My employer pays the, the, the claims for us directly out of cash flow. And then they buy insurance protection only to protect against large claims. And so whether it's self-funded or insured, if the cost of the plan exceeds that $10,500 threshold, the employer is going to pay a tax for 40% for every dollar it exceeds the threshold. So the problem then is the health costs are going up? The problem is the claims. Yes, the cost of claims, the cost of care. That's the big problem. Sure. Well, we have no regulatory guidance on this yet. So those age, what you're referring to is a plan that has age graded premiums. Right. And usually uh, those occur with employers with less than 50 employees. Um, and we don't have any regulatory guidance on that, but it, it's hoped that that scenario will be addressed in, in the regs when they come out. But what, you, what you see here real quickly is an example of a uh, Today, or in 2010, an employee-only premium of $400 a month, and this is the, the ravages of inflation, if you will, um, it, it isn't unusual in my career for premiums to go up at a rate exceeding 10% a year, but in this illustration, we're assuming just that, 10% a year, starting in 2010. And you can see by 2018, um, at, at, our, at those rates of increase, that that plan will be right up against the Cadillac tax just below it, the threshold. Is there any expectation that, that once these exchanges are groups that they can bargain with them and bring the cost down because of competition? Or is it just a natural assumption that these are just going to keep going up? I think the hope is that there will be more competition in the marketplace to bring the, the cost down. But that's not a certainty at this stage of the game. OK. Um, We've got a lot more pending guidance. Um, we've received a lot over the last year or two. There's a lot more coming. Um, of perhaps interest here will be uh, state decisions on essential benefits. Uh, the government, the federal government, is not defining the, the exact level of essential benefits, but leaving it to the, the state marketplaces. Uh, simple cafeteria plans are where most employers allow their employees to pay their premium contributions in pre-tax dollars. Um, we have no guidance on that yet. Um, we talked about the non-discrimination issues. Um, and then we don't have a lot of detail on the implementation of the exchanges yet. So a lot will be changing. Uh, it's a lot to keep up with us uh, over the next several months. So um, OK, the, the, the question was about um, wellness incentives in the law uh, following the observation that um, this gentleman has heard that about 75% of the healthcare costs can be traced to obesity. Um, I don't know that 75% is the, an accurate number, but it's certainly a big number. It's a high percentage for sure. Um, and overall lifestyle, um, uh, overall lifestyle decisions are attributable for, for about 70, 75%, not just obesity. Um, the, the law um, permits an employer to offer incentives up to 30% of premium for wellness incentives. So the idea of changing employee behaviors and, and family behaviors, eating healthier, getting more exercise, et cetera, is becoming a bit of a, um, a, a cultural, um, I certainly don't want to say fad or trend, but it is becoming a cultural reality in, in many parts of corporate America. 
Um, that subsidy can, or that the wellness subsidy can go up to 50% to uh, for smoking cessation programs. So pr prior to this, the cap was 20%. So the law has built in uh, or improved the incentives for employers to engage in those, in those programs. Um, what we find at this stage of the game, however, is that um, the programs that are being shopped around in the market right now um, are actually not delivering as intended. Um, and so that's another whole area of controversy and that's another half hour discussion. But, um, but the idea of personal behavior becoming more and more a part of this is, is definitely on the horizon. Yes, sir. As I look at the system you're describing, it seems terribly complex and possibly even more complex than the so-called free market system it replaces. Am I correct in thinking that the cost of, of administering such a system per person covered is higher here than it would be with single payer health care? Um, don't know how to answer that. That's pure conjecture. Um, there's a lot of computing power going into this. Um, I, I honestly can't, can't answer that. Okay. Uh, time to turn it over to Deb. Thank you. I hate it when I have to stand next to him. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I thought of the chair. <laughs> for obvious reasons. Well, I hope you've all been taking notes for the quiz at the end of all this. Um, well, I'm charged tonight with talking about impact of uh, health care reform on uh, the industry, and I'll talk about physicians as well as hospitals, but also on you as consumers of health care and uh, the community. Um, in look, which one? That's the space bar. Oh, the space bar. Okay. Um, in looking at uh, preparing for this, I thought it was kind of useful to go back and revisit what were the sort of principles and objectives of health care reform uh, to begin with. And I want to go just on record in, in pointing out that uh, although hospitals and physicians are going to face tremendous challenges in this coming 10-year period as this rolls out. Um, we were also very much in favor of this law and the need for health care reform. I think personally, as somebody who's been in this field for 40 years, it's unconscionable that this country had about 47 million people or whatever estimate you look at uh, not having insurance and having to access most of their care by waiting in an emergency room, which is just one small thing that drives our cost of care up. So this is this expanded coverage was certainly and better access to care on the part of a good group of our a good additional group of our citizens, but not all, by the way, because we know that not everybody is going to sign up under the exchanges. The tax penalties to individuals at the beginning of the plan are rather small, and people that are in a healthy situation may say, "Hey, I'll pay." 96 bucks a year to, to in taxes not to get coverage. Even people under the expanded Medi-Cal coverage uh, definitions may not seek that care. Another uh, good question that came up, is this really going to reduce the cost of health care? I'll tell you my opinion about that at the end. I can give that opinion more easily than Dave can, I think. Um, it should enhance the quality of patient care. I do believe that, and the safety of patient care. Um, it is going to provide a standardized array of benefits that people can understand, these, uh, the precious metal plan array that people can compare and contrast and look at costs in, re in relation to those. And I do think there's going to be differences in those costs between the different um, carriers. I think it should be a catalyst to changes in healthcare delivery in a lot of ways, but many of them positive, and I'm going to, that's a lot of what I'll talk about in the next few minutes. Um, it will provide, require that insurers provide coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. And um, I'm hoping that it begins to put a little bit more personal responsibility, the person, the person who asked the obesity question, personal responsibility on the consumer for sharing in their health care costs. I often try to characterize for my friends why the economic principles of health care as an industry are like nothing else on earth. Um, because most of us are lucky enough, unless you're not insured, most of us 
do not really share substantially in the cost of our health care. We, because we, for, since 1965, we've had health with Medicare, Medicaid, most of us have gotten our insurance through our, our employer. So that, I think, has insulated us to really feeling the impact of the cost of health care. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the changes that have occurred so far, because this actually was passed in 2010. Um, the two Daves um, talked about what began in 2013 and on, but there have been some changes positive, that introduction of the coverage of preventive care, uh, allowing children under the age of 26 to get insured through their parents' uh, plans with their employers. I'm sad to say my children were both 27 when that was passed. But, um, and then kids with pre-existing conditions. We, we talked about the fact that's going to apply to adults, but that applied to kids in 2010. Um, insurance companies being held accountable to pay out 80 to 85 percent of their premiums in actual payments of health care costs, what's called a, a medical loss ratio, which says something that the insurance company thinks that's a loss when they actually pay out coverage for their premiums. Um, the, and then finally, uh, the fact that there were incentives introduced in another stimulus package for hospitals to start introducing, and physicians to start introducing the electronic health record, which I think although it's a little different than the um, Affordable Care Act goes kind of hand in hand with making the Affordable Care Act doable. So what are the implications for hospitals? First, um, the way hospitals and physicians have gotten paid historically was the more services were rendered, the more they were paid. The more admissions to a hospital, the more the hospital got paid. The more procedures, as Dave said, the physician did, the more they got paid. And a lot of, that's called fee-for-service, kind of. And a lot of people think that is one of the fundamental uh, problems with high costs of, of care, because the incentives were just to use more and more and more. Good contrast to that is Kaiser as a system, a capitated plan where uh, that plan got received in premiums, a fixed amount of money per month to take care of all the, or reasonably, all of the needs of, of the beneficiary. So that's an incentive actually to do less, but hopefully less and appropriate care. Now we're still going to be under somewhat of a, a uh, fee-for-service basis system during a long transition period, and that's a confusing thing for providers, I think. But what has been overlaid on this is what we, we're now calling value-based purchasing. So as hospitals uh, and physicians, to some extent, hospitals first, kind of, basically we have certain qualifiers to our payment, particularly we're, we're over 50% of our patients are insured by Medicare. It's a very high percentage for any hospital. But our total Medicare reimbursement will begin to be modified by certain things that relate to quality or, or outcomes. For example, patient satisfaction. We'll get, we already get queried, uh, we query our patients through a national system. Um, were you satisfied with how clean the hospital was? Did you feel that there was too much noise at night? One of the biggest problems that a hospital has. Um, would you recommend this hospital to your friends? Those kind of scores really make a difference in what we will get paid in the future, really beginning this year. Um, second example is what we call core measures, and I'll try not to use too many buzzwords, but now we have a set of, of metrics or standards for quality of care. When a patient's discharged, do they get good instructions for their care after discharge? Did a patient who had a heart attack get discharged on a beta blocker to prevent future heart problems. Those kind of things become very important. We measure those, speaking of the administrative cost that's added to keep track of all that. But that will influence our overall reimbursement on an adjustment basis by Medicare. And withholding, this is one of my favorite ones, withholding admission, re reimbursement, or reducing, I should say, probably reimbursement, for the incidents you have of readmissions, and right now that's starting in three diagnostic categories you can see up there, but whenever a patient gets readmitted uh, within 30 days, that will affect, in a global way, our reimbursement for all Medicare patients. So you will see a lot of stuff that's driven, in a good way, I think, 
to now taking care of the patient beyond the hospital experience. I'll talk a little bit just about meaningful use. This relates to that electronic health record. Um, basically, we now have an incentive beginning in 2012. Most hospitals, some hospitals are already heavily electronically um, automated in terms of their health record. We're kind of halfway there. Um, it's a very expensive process. However, uh, and it, by the way, will never get its return in terms of the stimulus money that's out there from Medicaid and Medicare to cover helping offset the cost of investing in these systems. But what it will do, I think, is improve quality and patient safety. And examples of that, what now we begin to use in healthcare, much more standardized protocols for taking care of patients by condition that are what we call evidence-based. So the old days of where Dr. Smith may have approached taking care of a pneumonia patient one way and Dr. Jones might have taken care of it in a totally different way with possibly different outcomes, begins to be much more standardized. And a lot of physicians worry about that because they call it cookbook medicine, but frankly, it, it assures patient safety and assures that, for example, before you might order a new medication, you have to do a certain type of lab work to do that. That's triggered in a whole algorithm that's used in the electronic medical record. So I think that kind of issue is, and we're spending in our organization probably about $3 million over uh, several years to implement this, but it's going to make a huge difference in patient safety. So it's very challenging times for hospitals. I sometimes wonder why I went into this business 40 years ago. Um, we will see, by the way, even though the premiums will go up, we fully expect to see reimburse, reimbursement continue to go down, as it has for hospitals for uh, the last several years reduced volumes. If you don't have as much incentive to do procedures or physicians don't, then you're going to see volume decline. We'll have um, fundamental shifts in the delivery system, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we have, and I think we in our organization, because we're a small community hospital, have um, really outstanding cost structure in terms of low, being a low cost provider. But some of the larger hospitals have not had the pressure to do that, that have had perhaps better contracts with payers. They are really facing an unrelenting need to look at and reduce their costs. Um, we're going to see increased regulation, more and more unfunded mandates uh, to change how we do work. Uh, so that adds inherently to the administrative costs of uh, running a hospital or running a physician practice. And very importantly, and I think this is a good thing, one that you'll hear more about from us in the next few months, I think a new wave of consolidation uh, among providers. As a small hospital, unless you're in a very large market, as an example, maybe John Muir in Walnut Creek, um, it's not going to be possible to be sustainable and successful under health care reform. It's very difficult right now. So that means looking at ways to build systems, to join partnerships with other providers, and we're spending a lot of our time looking at that right now. Uh, changing relationships between hospitals and physicians. Um, I've always loved working with physicians, and I, this is a very exciting time uh, for hospitals. Sometimes our incentives have not been aligned. For example, just one small example, hospital gets paid by Medicare on a DRG-based diagnostic-related group. So a person comes in, certain diagnosis, we get a flat fee for that admission. Doesn't matter how long the patient stays, with some exceptions. Doesn't really matter what kind of procedures that person has while they stay. Um, that we get a flat amount, we need to manage within that. Physician has a different payment structure. He gets paid uh, for making more visits if the patient stays longer. He may get paid if he does more procedures while the patient's in the hospital. So that's a clash right there. In the future, as we take care of a group of patients, physicians and hospitals, for which the, we're the responsible for the health of in, in the future, that's going to change, and I think that means we have to not only work to integrate our, our care of the patient and to uh, approach the marketplace successfully together, but it's also creating very changing and interesting roles for physicians and other caregivers. Um, for example, 
um, many years ago, the hospitalist concept was introduced. So when you're in the hospital, uh, you're taken care of by a physician who specializes, by and large, in most hospitals, who specializes just in taking care of patients who are ill and acutely ill in a hospital. Your primary care physician who 20 years ago would come and see you before the office started and after make rounds doesn't do that. He, stay, or he or she stays in their office and tries to be more efficient there but we're not gonna have enough primary care physicians, even in an urban area like this, and especially as more people now are getting coverage and the population is aging. So I think you're gonna see some interesting roles of physician extenders in the future. Already we see nurse practitioners, uh, as physician assistants playing different roles, and an interesting role, I think, which we'll get into the next discussion when we talk about kind of be going beyond the acute care walls, of what is being called an extensivist. So somebody who begins to take care of the very chronically ill patient who may account for about 80% of our healthcare costs, maybe 20% of the population, 80% of the costs, but they need the care of a special kind of primary care physician uh, to make sure that they can stay out of the hospital. So we'll see a new kind of type of role for physicians emerge. We like to think that at Alameda we're already outside the walls of, of acute care and that's been developing over time. We're very committed to long-term care. We have 181 skilled nursing facility beds in the community. Uh, we're doing a wound care clinic that's out in the community. We use a lot of interdisciplinary teams and we do a lot of partnering with other community agencies, whether it's home care or hospice, assisted living. Uh, home-based services, uh, those are going to be very important. We may not always do that ourselves, but we need to partner with those organizations. In response to the question about obesity, uh, this is really, I think, a tremendous subset of what we need to, to work on in uh, dealing with health care costs in the, in the country. For one reason is, even though we've seen a lot of smoking cessation, we all try to be more diligent about exercise. In fact, the incidence of obesity and uh, uh, diabetes, uh, all those other uh, those d diseases that are mentioned on the slide are going up in their incidence. Some of that's age related, a lot of it is lifestyle related. And we, um, for example, in Alameda County, 8% of people, adults, have diabetes. 33% of adult males are overweight. And the good news girls, only 25% of women are overweight. I was kind of very surprised about that statistic. I would have expected the opposite. Um, so we are looking at things like a medical home for people that have four, five, six chronic conditions where they can see a, a physician who specializes just in seeing really sick people and managing complex disease processes to make sure those people can avoid a hospitalization or an acute illness uh, an episode as much as possible. Um, more use of interdisciplinary teams and more use of real evidence-based protocols for care. Um, in general, this is where I think the community comes in and, and another, I think, very positive um, impact of where we're going is really our incentive becomes to keep people healthy. It's, it's, we've talked about this for a lot of years, but really we're moving now into an alignment of payments. So it really does make sense to keep people as healthy as possible and out of our healthcare system in terms of consuming services, uh, which means we have to be out in the community. Now we're doing that already. I think it, to me it's amazing, but my hospitalists make house calls now. So not only do they call after persons you know, out there and uh, discharge to make sure the next day and the next day they're, they're, do, they're following their orders, they're taking their meds, um, they don't run into some other complication. If they find they do, either a nurse goes out to see them or a physician goes out to see them. Um, so we're doing that kind of sort of short-term population management. But on a larger level, you know, um, Tracy mentioned at the beginning our, our stroke assessment. We have been doing these assessments for the last two years since we've had a certified stroke program. We have identified so many people and educated people that probably would never have come in until 
the stroke was fatal, basically, or recognized the signs, or in the case of one of our patients, was talking to his mailman who realized this guy's not talking right and went in to get his wife and got him to our hospital. So that kind of thing, that education and awareness, I think is tremendously positive. Um, we do other screenings for uh, my favorite body mass index and blood pressure, uh, blood sugar, all those fun things. Um, we're doing a lot of diabetic teaching and uh, nutritional involvement with people getting them back. We're very happy with the childhood obesity program that we worked on with the schools as a, as a, in concert with uh, Alameda being one of the best 100 places for kids to live. Um, but we don't want fat kids running around because fat kids become sick adults or sick kids in some cases. So, uh, But these are just a few examples of what we've done to institute this. We're going to have to get a lot more creative in the future. And I think that, that brings us in close alignment with our, our uh, community. And finally, I would just want to add that I think Alameda is a wonderful laboratory for <coughs> being able to work closely with the community and pursuing some of these population health uh, initiatives and then being able to measure the results. Sometimes it's very hard in a big urban area to see if you've really made a difference. So my last slide is sort of asking the question which you might want to put to any of us is healthcare reform a good thing? I think it, re it provides access to most people, a lot more people than, it, than was the case before. Um, but I do think we need to realize there is a, a large group of people that will still not have access. Undo, un, un, undocumented, um, the people that just don't sign up because they don't think it's important to have health insurance. And educating people, if you thought it's hard to understand all this, and we think it's hard and we're in the business, think about educating people as they enroll in some of these plans. It's going to be a big challenge. Um, improved health care safety and quality, I think, is going to be out there. And my personal opinion is, and I'm sad to say this, I do not think it's going to reduce health care costs because it's so complex and, and I think there are a lot, of, a lot of added layers of administration. I hope I'm wrong on that, but we can debate that if we want. So that's my conclusion. Yes, ma'am. You know, I'm, I'm curious, one of your statements was reduce reimbursement. <laughs> You're talking about reimbursements to the hospital, correct? Yes. Okay, and, and based now on your very last statement, and all this administrative involvement required, how <laughs> been able to negotiate through wonderful relationships with our unions a freeze essentially in wages for uh, all of our unionized employees. So in our case, now that I can't say that's a sustainable strategy for the long-term future, but that's how we've managed in our case. So is Alameda in the black? No, we will make a slight loss this year, we're projecting. Correct. Did that include you? Yes, it did. I have not had a pay. In fact, I've been at Alameda Hospital for five years. I have never had a pay increase in five years. And in fact, my salary went down two years ago by 5%. Yes? Um, is it um, the problem that, um, about the cost and the shortage of uh, 
primary care physicians. Uh -huh. For a long time, the nursing community has been growing their nurse practitioners, both in pediatrics and in adult health, and particularly in geriatrics. And um, they they have, uh, and Kaiser has used nurse practitioners within their HMO. But the nurses have had trouble bumping up against the medical societies because the medical um, the practice acts have been so constrained so as to prevent nurses from usurping any of the power. And is that starting to um, be um, alleviated or is that somehow still a big problem and still keeping the costs of the physicians up? Well, um, that's, there's a lot of elements to that question, but I think that um, what I will say sort of on the grassroots level is I see a tremendous amount of openness on the part of physicians to an expanded role of these practitioners, whether it's nurses or physicians assistants. Um, actually, I think I could get off on the medical society, which by the way only represents about 40% of the physicians in Alameda and Contra Costa County. So it's not as powerful a factor as it once was. Um, I would say something different about the American Medical Association, but that's a whole other story. Um, but I think one of the things that's more of a challenge is uh, the, um, the licensing regulations. So there's a lot of strict uh, you know, limitations on what different categories of personnel can do. And one of the things we've talked about, California Hospital Association, is working more with the state to get some more flexibility in some of those definitions. Yes, sir. I've heard that the health insurance people reimburse doctors and hospitals at approximately 20% of billing. Is anybody doing anything about that? I try to cry at night when I go to bed. <laughs> um, uh, it's actually, in our case, it's about 23%. Um, it, overall, that is in the overall spectrum for our our bills that go out, we're collecting 23% in terms of what we call net net revenue. Well, it's, it's very complicated, so we could have a whole other session on this topic. And this goes to what the Brill article in Time Magazine that Dave alluded to says. One of the, one of the pitfalls of that is the gross charges, the charges that people see on bills and are like, oh, you know, how can they possibly charge five bucks for an aspirin or whatever? Those are to totally artificial. They're totally artificial. They, they don't bear any resemblance to what we get reimbursed. And as a hospital industry, actually, this year, CHA, California Hospital Association, is really taking on a task of trying to change the whole charge structure for hospitals. Because people don't, don't understand it. They get mad. Frankly, you shouldn't lose a lot of sleep over it because we don't get paid that much. But the only reason it started as long ago is that there was something called cost shifting. So as we got less and less from Medicare, hospitals tried to make that up by charging more to the private insurance sector. So they jacked up their rates and they got a percentage of that that was higher from the, the private sector. But those days are over. I, I do believe healthcare reform in terms of what we get reimbursed is going to be the great equalizer and everything will be more along the level of Medicare. You know, a lot of the things I talked about in terms of the quality measurements and so forth are, are going to be also expected by the private payers as well. But Medicare will set the gold standard on all of that. So, yes. One of the things that had been a big topic early on uh, before even the Affordable Health Care Act was passed was the cost of emergency room care and the fact that so much emergency room care was being used by the uninsured as their primary means mm -hmm. of access. Um, and I don't hear that being talked about very much anymore. Do you anticipate, what, what are the costs at Alameda Hospital and is that getting better, getting worse, and how will this impact? Well, uh, we probably don't see as much of it. About, you know, seven, I would say 7% or 8% of our uh, volume in our ED is um, from uninsured, people with no insurance. And, and interpret that, by the way, as We'll, don't, we'll never get paid by those people. Right. You know, it's not even worthwhile going after that. We, I mean, we have to legally, but you're not going to see that money. We, but we live in a sort of a nice demographic area where there's a greater percentage of insured uh, patients. If you go to Highland, that's completely different. So I would hope when people have insurance, they don't have to seek their 
primary care, that initial access, in a very expensive setting like an ED that is not equipped to do good primary care. So that could be actually an area where we'll begin to see some savings overall in the system. And I know, because I'm working a lot with Highland, I know that they are trying to beef up their clinics, their primary care base, so that they can accommodate more patients in anticipation of more uh, covered lives. I don't want to take, you want to go to a whole format or um, whatever you want to do. Well, I, are there more questions for Debbie specifically? So, um, one of the issues that I have found as a person who works in healthcare is that there is um, a gap between the hospital experience and the home care experience because I think that home care is going to be really quite important going to assume more importance mm -hmm. because you're getting an aging population and the coordination of care and having better outcomes is really going to be critical. So that low where Alameda Hospital is kind of an entity unto itself in comparison to say Kaiser or the Sutter uh, uh, entity. It, it would seem to me that would be quite an interesting challenge for Alameda Hospital uh, in terms of how it works with the community providers. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, how you're dealing with that in the electronic transfer of information, et cetera. Well, we have a one step pretty far developed, and that is the, the link between us and skilled nursing care. When I mentioned that we have 181 skilled nursing patients, that transition results in a lot of continuity of care. And actually, by the way, our hospitalists provide care to those patients in that setting as well. Uh, we don't run a home care agency, and, and we don't have a hospice, but we do have relationships with a number of those organizations. And my feeling is it's far more important to have build the relationships and the links and to make sure electronically we can talk to those providers than it is necessarily providing those services ourselves. So when I say being responsible for the continuum outside of the walls of the hospital, it, it, that is a very important priority for us. But we just have to approach it, I think, a little more creatively. Yes? I couldn't quite hear what she first said. I mentioned what? Expandable uh. Medicare. Expandable Medicare. Or expanded Medicare. No, I think she's confusing Medicare. I think I might have yes, said Medi-Cal expansion in the, in the eligible Medi-Cal population. And that was what I, either one of the Daves had talked about the fact that um, in Medicare's uh, kind of criteria are becoming much more simplified not as categorical and more based just on income levels. What do you want to do? I'm going to wrap. I'm going to wrap. Okay. Thanks, Debbie. Um, if I could just take this opportunity, I, I want to thank everybody in a second. But you know, there are, there were several questions that were from people who were wondering how this impacts Medicare, and that's a big question. And of course, um, we heard that it's not directly benefiting you as a Medicare beneficiary and your um, either your, your um, coverage because you're in a certain plan or your deductible, et cetera. But what it is going to do, what it, what it sounds to me and what I heard here, it is going to impact the way that the physicians and providers and hospitals and, and others both the way they coordinate your care, the types of benefits that you have available, and um, the way the care is delivered. So there's going to be an impact, even though you don't maybe you won't see it in your you won't have to change plans immediately or ever perhaps, and you won't see it in your um, deductible or your Medigap, what's called your Medigap supplemental coverage. You will see it. What I anticipate and what it sounds like is that you'll see it when you go to visit your physician or you go to the hospital or you go to access 
additional benefits. So I think that's really exciting. And, and I think I, as I wrap it up here, I want to say that that was the area where I thought how these three speakers really complemented each other. They all, I learned a lot and I actually have a background in this area. And um, I thought it was just tremendous, all of the different information for, from each perspective, from individuals and um, businesses, Medicare, Medicaid, um, programs as well as for Alameda Hospital. So again, I would just thank all three of the speakers. And um, I want to do a couple of things before I, I know Ruth wants to wrap up. I want to recognize the person who preceded me immediately on the hospital board, who's now a member of our Alameda City Council, um, Dr. Stuart Chen. Thanks for coming. And I also want to urge all of you who aren't members, and I see a lot of you out there who I don't recognize as members, to, um, to consider joining the League of Women Voters. These are exciting events. This is just one of them. And there's another event coming up on the 28th of March, about exactly a month from today, at Cardinal Point. And at that event, you can learn more about what is going on in our school district, the state of our Alameda Public Schools. And that will be a presentation by the president of the school board, Neil Tam, and the school superintendent, Kirsten Vital. So I hope you all can join us at Cardinal Point on March 28th. And you'll get this information once you join the League of Women Voters. You'll get it in your mailbox every month. So thank you all for coming again. And I'm Ruth Dixon is going to wrap up for us. Thanks, JC. I want to remind you that men are very welcome to join the League of Women Voters. We have male members. Jeff Camber, our previous president, is a living example of the power of the male to uh, lead a women's organization. Yes. Good $70 value. Right. John, did you have a question? I just want to add a personal note. I've been a League member now for almost a decade. I have never had as much <laughs> as many capable people, mostly women, make oh, working for open government and transparency and other good things in this society than I have in legal women voters and all these. John, that is a real testimonial. Thank you. <laughs> so, aside from um, uh, augmenting the Thanks to our wonderful panel and to those of you who attended. I just would like to mention a couple of more events. Um, please uh, read the League of Women Voters position on health care. We have copies there because um, the League of Women Voters is co-sponsoring an event that's happening in April. Um, it's a film um, called The Healthcare Movie narrated by uh, Keith Sullivan, uh, a documentary that tells the story about health care system in Canada turned out to be so completely different from that in the United States, given that at one point they were essentially the same. How it or originated in Canada, how it works for ordinary Canadians, how it's paid for, and how it compares to the American uh, counterpart. So we've been talking about this very complicated Affordable Care Act. Um, the uh, League of Women Voters is on record as favoring a single-payer system, although it is a very clearly in support of the Affordable Care Act as a step in that direction. But what wonders, what wonders if it really um, is uh, whether we can really move in that direction. So this healthcare movie is being uh, shown on Saturday night, April 18th. It's um, at the Alameda Public Affairs Forum at the library, uh, the meeting room at the back of the library, and it starts at 7, and there's a welcome mixer at 6.30. So we certainly urge you to attend. And then the final meeting of the, not the final meeting, the, the May uh, general meeting, the last Thursday night of May of the League of Women Voters, we will be hearing about the state of the city of Alameda Healthcare District. So uh, this will be a slightly different uh, uh, slant on some of the things we've been hearing uh, tonight, but more about the health district itself. So um, many, many thanks to all of you for coming, and um, we are now adjourned. Thanks so much. <laughs>